This is episode number 154 of the Guns Magazine podcast. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast, one of the shooting world's biggest gun talk programs. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting folks who make up the world of shooting, hunting, law enforcement, and the firearms industry. But first, here's a quick word about our sponsors. The presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast is the R7 Mako by Kimber. The R7 Mako is a high-capacity polymer frame striker-fired micro-compact from Kimber. Here's just a taste of what you get. 12 and 14 round total capacity with the flush and extended magazines, while the performance carry trigger has the smooth pull and clean break you'd expect from a high-end single-action handgun. The R7 also comes optics ready, or you can have it with optics already installed. Kimber's R7 Mako will feed your appetite for something different. See how at r7mako.com. The supporting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast is Craft Holsters. Craft Holsters specializes in production of custom leather holsters for semi-autos and revolvers. Their main mission is to provide every responsible gun owner with a truly custom holster experience at a very reasonable price. Check them out at craftholsters.com. It's as old as law enforcement itself, the choir practice. The term was popularized by Joseph Wambaugh in his book, The Choir Boys, but every cop knows what it means. In today's episode, Roy Huntington and I share a few of the less provocative stories we've heard, but of course never participated in, regarding those after-work get-togethers. Now here's Roy and I as we talk about cops choir practice. Good afternoon, Roy. Good afternoon. Well, today's topic, something we've come up with a while back and thought it might be fun and um, actually, it, it was inspired by a reader letter. Uh, one of our uh, readers of Guns Magazine is a retired law enforcement officer, as both of us are. And we had told uh, uh, cop stories, practical jokes, uh, one of which I'm still ashamed to have admitted, even though it was true. And he said, you guys ought to talk about choir practice. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's something you did. It's a term you really don't hear much anymore. But it used to really be something, and it came from a book by Joseph Wambaugh called The Choir Boys, and they would get together and have choir practice after the shift, as did, I assume, you, and I certainly did, and I've got a few stories about it, and we're going to talk about that today, but turns out you knew Joe Wambaugh. Well, I did, actually. Um, he was a really nice guy. Uh I guess I technically still know him. I don't know. <laughs> is he still with us? I wasn't sure if he was. Yeah, I think he is. Oh, yeah, he okay. was always in San Diego and uh, I, I, he had reached out to us two or three times. And then finally he called me up one day and he said, Hey, I'm going to write another book on um, uh, something about murder at the America's cup races and w which were going on in San Diego in, and they were based in mission Bay. And so I was on the Harbor unit. And so he, I said, yeah, come on down. And so he came down, rode around with us for a day or two. And we told him all kinds of silly stories <laughs> about the, all the stuff that happens out there that half of which are not believable, but were true. Yeah. And so uh, I have a picture that day somewhere here. And uh, so he thanked us very much. And uh, when some months later, I got a copy of a book in the mail signed by him with a thank you. Hmm. And uh, he was kind enough to put our unit in the forward and thank us by name and stuff. But in there, it's called floaters. <laughs> and uh, so if somebody's bored and they can find the book floaters, you'll see my miscreant self in there. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I actually talked to him about the fact that choir boys and, you know, cause he was big stuff in yeah. those early days. I remember seeing him on, you know, the best talk shows and, and all that kind of stuff. I did ask him, how do you get inspiration for your next book? And he said, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but he said, well, when the checkbook gets a little bare. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> well, that's kind of what inspires us, though, isn't it? It's like, oh, I, I have a paycheck coming. I, I better do something to earn it. They don't just pay me to sit around and shoot. <laughs> better do somewhere. I don't know if, if uh, I don't know if cops nowadays do like choir practice or 
because it, it's, nowadays these idiots are probably posted on Facebook or, yeah, you know, or it's going to be f- filmed by the cameras that are everywhere that we used to go hide, you know, <laughs> remember construction sites and dead ends and yeah. commercial districts. And <laughs> remember the next day you would drive by where the choir practice was the night before and, and see the <laughs> beer cans. And, <laughs> and every once in a while, someone's still sleeping, you know, yes. you know, not to cast aspersions on the law enforcement fraternity, but I'm sure they have some version of it. Now they probably just don't call it choir practice. That's, probably old school and went away with your and I, your and mine generation. But uh, we had our share of them. And there's there was truly a practical value, I think. And this is kind of what brought this up was there is so much emphasis nowadays on PTSD and, and uh, dealing with what law enforcement has to deal with. And I get it. But back in our day, before we had all these services and, and critical stress debriefing meetings and all this stuff, we went and got a six pack and went to choir practice and, and, uh, you know, kind of talked it out. And I think there was some value to it. I really do. There was, there was some, I'll even admit drunken buffoonery at times, but there was also, it was one of those environments where you could kind of talk about some things that everybody understood, even if they weren't there at that particular incident you were talking about, but you could kind of get some stuff off your chest and, and help process. And I don't know if they do that much anymore. Uh, you know, you're exactly right, though, because we there wasn't a department shrink. You know, there wasn't. And if your sergeant was this grizzled guy that would tell you, just suck it up. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, rub some and, dirt on it and get back in there. Yeah. And so I agree with you, you know, that you would get uh, the squad would come together, you know, and you just go sit around for an hour or two, drink some beer or something and talk about whatever's going on. Complain about the agency, yeah. complain about, <laughs> you know, the stupid rules or some idiot that you stopped today who was being a, you know. Yeah. I was going to say, you talked about everything from, you know, the, the stupid new rule that came out about timesheets or whatever, all the way up to the murder you'd been to. And, you know, it, one would lead into the other and then you'd bounce back and forth. And you, it was, I guess, a natural way of kind of touching on things that uh, were a little uncomfortable. But uh, it really, I think it did help a lot of uh, guys and gals to kind of get get that out and talk about it and get that out of their uh their memory box or whatever, but there was some drunken buffoonery. I will admit. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize this because it's a, the way TV is and the way mainstream media is. Uh, they think these policemen are these, uh, uh, you know, robotic, you know, just these, they show up and they suddenly look like policemen and they mm-hmm. go about very mechanical and very automatic. And then they think it's, if this, then that, you know, and, yeah. and Just I don't think facts, a lot ma'am. of, yeah, I don't, it's not RoboCop, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I think a lot of people don't see that, especially the way cops today's dress or today's dress, you know, they, they have full armor on, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of times on the outside of their uniform, mm-hmm. you know, we used to wear body armor underneath the shirt. No one even used, knew we had it on. Right. And uh, so now a lot of them are, are geared up and they look like a SWAT cop, mm-hmm. but they're a patrol guy, you know? And so it is intimidating and all that. And so I don't know if they, we should find out, we should get a younger cop and, and get him on and, and, and see what they do now. But it, in a microcosm, at least when you and I were doing it, Police work was like being in the military in the sense that ask any World War II vet or Vietnam vet or somebody like that and ask him, why did you fight? Well, then none of them say for America. Yeah. You know, I mean, at some level, it's in there somewhere. Yeah. But it's always, well, I, uh, you know, I fight for my buddies, Mm -hmm. you know, to protect my buddies. And uh, and so I think that certainly when we were there, that's how it was. Just squads were usually pretty tight. And, and a squad for people who don't know might be six people, eight, 10, 15 people, depending on your agency size. And ours tended to be in the about 12 people, give or take a little bit. And so at any night, let's say you're out and you're, you're, you're clearing the the lineup and you've got maybe six people who are your friends, Mm -hmm. or at least you work with them every day. And so boy, if one of them puts out a cover call, you know, your heart beats fast. It's, you don't want to let them down. Right. right? So you, right. you do that. 
And, uh, and so sometimes afterwards, boy, it just feels good to get together. And, you yeah. know, and, and you say things like, oh man, you put out that cover now call. And I, man, <laughs> I was, you know, I was going 95 down, you know, third Avenue. Yeah, you know? and, exactly. Well, you know, and, and part of it too, was the shift work factor. Um, the majority of cops work an afternoon type shift. So whether it's two to 10, you know, one to nine, whatever it is, and you get off and your family and significant others are probably going to bed and you're hyped up from all the fun you've endured over the previous eight or 12 hours. So what are you going to do with all that energy? You can, you can sit there and watch TV until about 4 a.m. Like a lot of us did, but sometimes it, like you said, it was just good, especially after something noteworthy, get together, invite the guys or, or the rest of the squad over, bring a six pack and let's hang out. And uh, those were some really good times. And, and I'll tell my one really memorable choir practice story. And I remember it was after some kind of major event. And uh, I invited my buddies and in our area, it's it's fairly rural. So the city, the county, the state, even the conservation officer, it's very common. You'll back each other up. So this was kind of a mixed group. And I had just moved into a, a new house on the uh, outskirts of town. And we didn't even have a yard yet. I'm, I'm in the Midwest. So we have this stuff called grass. And uh, so we didn't even have a yard, but we had a nice big patio. So I cleared it with my spouse, the higher authority. I'm going to invite some of the guys over. We had this thing go on and we're going to set out back and have a few, you know, beers. The next morning she comes out and goes, have you been out on the patio? And I said, well, no, did, did we leave beer cans? No, it's all cleaned up, but it smells terrible. I said, what do you mean? There must be a lot of cats in this neighborhood. It, it just smells terrible. It smells like, you know, a, a cat's been out there spraying. And what it was, was when, when the guys under the cover of darkness needed oh, yeah. to offload sure. a few beers, they didn't step off the patio. So there was a high nitrogen load in the soil all around the patio. And I'll tell you, you know, that's the, that's the mildest story I think yeah. I've ever heard about the car practice. I, I mean, in the middle seventies to late seventies, you know, there were, it was like the old West, at least where we were. I mean, and, and, and as soon as the off duty gun came out at choir practice, you know, that there was going to be a street light oh, shot no. out here in a second or, or something, you know, and that's oh. usually everyone would quickly say, gosh, look at that time. I've got to go. I was going to say, you know, and, that's usually when well, I'm like, ah, I, yeah, I forgot. I got church tomorrow morning early. <laughs> yeah. But you're right though, about, you know, you get off, we had a shift that ended at 11. And so, gee, you know, you might have had just been involved in a pursuit and crash and covering units doing something or, you know, a, a messy crash fatality, you know. And so you are your brain's still processing all this stuff and you can't just go home and walk in and go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you're right. And of course, sometimes it, I, I'm not saying that we did this, but I had heard <laughs> that sometimes alcoholic beverages would be recovered from minors. Yes. And rather than arresting them, cops would do the kind thing and give them a warning and let them go. And then, of course, you had to do something with that stuff. Right. And from what I hear, it was often put to good use. <laughs> well, I, I kind of have a story about that. This is all way past statute of limitations, okay? When I was a baby, young rookie cop, I was up at the police station, middle of the night, and one of the guys was cleaning out our evidence storage and getting rid of this, that, and the other, and he uh, produced a brand new bottle of J.W. Dant bourbon, and it had been confiscated for something. It had an evidence label and all that stuff from years prior, so it had just been setting in there. And side note for bourbon, bourbon aficionados, it does not age once it's in the glass. It just... Once it's bottled, it is like the day it's bottled. So it's not like it was something super great. It's not like wine that gets better with age. But anyway, he was uh, doing that, and he knew I appreciated bourbon. He goes, do you want that? I'm like, well, yeah. What are you going to do with it? He goes, otherwise, I'll just pour it down the drain. And uh, I suppose ethically, that's what he should have done. But anyway, he gave me the bottle. And I took it home and set it in the liquor cabinet and threw all the years, all the trauma and drama through a divorce, through all sorts of life changes, I never drank it. 
and the more one day, like a decade later, I realized, well, that bottle's still in there, you know? And I thought, you know what? I got it within like two months of being hired. I, I wasn't even out of FTO. I don't believe. And I thought I'm going to save it. So on the day of my retirement, our retirement party, that is, I decided the city would have thrown me a retirement party with cake and punch and all that. And I thought, if you know me, we're going to have a party. So I paid for it myself. I hired a, a band with some guys that I played with before, and they were a great band. We rented out one of the local uh, venues and we had a blowout. It was fantastic. But uh, during one of the uh, breaks from the band, I had to get up and say a few words and thanks to everybody. And there was a lot of folks there. And I brought that bottle with me and I told the story and I said, I have, you know, held onto this thing for 26, 27 years, however long it was. And I said, and today I'm going to sample it. So I twisted it off, took a little, little hit and it was, it was very good bourbon. And then I put the cap back on. There's a bunch of people standing around. The bottle got wrestled from my hands and it came back to me about 15 minutes later, empty, <laughs> even like elderly women were slamming a big drink out of it. And if, if somebody had had a lip fungus, the entire community probably would have had it, but it was, it was kind of cool. And they actually incorporated that in a little ritual afterwards. So, uh, I, I always thought that was kind of cool. It wasn't strictly choir practice, but, uh, it was kind of, I think the it same qualifies. Ways. It was your last uh, official choir practice. You yeah, know? I mean, exactly. It was off the books. It was among your friends. It involved free booze. Yep. I'm sorry, Brent, but that qualifies as part. <laughs> well, and I'm proud to say it is my my retirement party. I don't know about my career, but my retirement party is still spoken with awe and reverence. Um, <laughs> I actually I drove home from it. I was, you know, I'd had a drink or two through the evening, but I thought that's one of those nights either it'll get way out of control or I'm just going to try and maintain. So I did, and I was fine, but. I can't say that for remember. everybody else. Oh, no. There, there are some no, really that's... epic stories after we shut the place down and I went home. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you how those bullet holes get there. You know, exactly. I remember one time the police department was banned from a restaurant out <laughs> off the freeway because I guess it wasn't my gang. But some gang at a choir practice nearby yeah. decided it would be a good idea to shoot a couple of holes in their in their restaurant <laughs> sign. I don't know how they figured that one out. I'll tell you, though, that was really interesting. Uh, first time it happened to me, we were having a just because usually a choir practice is just that you park your cars down at the end of some street and you lean against the hood, you know, and you drink a beer or two. And then everybody says good night and you go home. That's mm -hmm. usually what it is. Well, I remember we had this one one night and, and we were doing just that, you know, nothing bad, really. Um, and the lieutenant showed up, the patrol lieutenant showed up and in his, you know, you remember you used to still wear your uniform, but you'd put a cover, right? So you put a Pendleton or something over. But so you you're still not in uniform. Your, yeah. Yeah. You still had uniform pants on shiny black shoes, and all that kind of stuff. So I've heard uh, that so he, allegedly. He, yeah, he shows up and uh, and we, and what do you think? Right. We're all thinking, oh, man, oh, geez. Oh, no. you know, we're in. Oh, geez. We're how are we going to explain our way out of this? Right. Because I'm not sure that drinking alcohol in an industrial complex <laughs> at midnight is legal or not. I don't yeah. know. Right. So he shows up. And when we're just, you know, mm, uh, 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 we were just getting ready to go. And he said, well, not on my account. And I remember he popped his trunk and he reached out and he brought out a couple of six packs of really good, expensive beer. Ah. <laughs> and and he said, here you go. Help yourself. And and of course, you know, the part of you goes, is this a setup? Am I <laughs> exactly? I is well, over there with the, the video camera. There, right? Yeah. And as it turns out, it was sort of, it was the end of shift. And I remember, and he said, I just want to thank everybody. You guys rocked this shift. Wow. And that, you know, we took care of business and nobody got in trouble and you guys did great. And they're talking about it. And he said, so I just want to thank you personally. And I thought this would be a good way to do it. And it was like, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But boy, talk about score boss points. Yeah. You know? And wow. it, really, it wasn't the booze. It was just the fact that he did that. Yeah. And yeah. just the camaraderie and, you know, all that stuff that it's hard to quantify. You can go to these leadership schools and you should do this and treat this and say this. And but 
you know, those kind of things are what really build those bonds between everybody. Well, I've got another story about <clears throat> how our FOP lodge got taken away from us. Shall I share that one? <laughs> Your FOP fraternal yeah. order of, of police. police lodge yeah. got taken away from you. Yeah. I didn't think that was possible. Well, let me say again, this is this is several decades ago. I was the brand new FOP president of our local chapter. And it was one of those things, everybody kind of did their turn. It wasn't that big of an honor, really, to be the president of the FOP locally. But it was my turn, and I took it. And we had a lodge uh, room, basically, up above a uh, store downtown. And it was real nice. The owner of the building let us have this room, and uh, that's where we'd have our meetings. And, you know, we'd have a choir practice or two or three. Well, the only downer part of the story, it was, this would have been 1990 or 91, forgive me if I forget my dates exactly, um, Indiana State Police Master Trooper Michael Green had been murdered, and Mike was a friend of all of ours, and we went through all that process that you go through, and, and the big uh, ceremony, and the TV cameras, and all that, so uh, about a week later, we decided we need the, all of us locally need to get together and blow off some steam, so... I believe we purchased every can of beer within a three county region and uh, we had a party and uh, it was it was I would say it was a wild party. At one point, there was like, remember the console TVs, the great big ones that were almost a piece of furniture? Well, guys, they would get rid of there. So they'd take it up there under the guise of, well, they'll use it at the lodge. So there was like four or five of those TVs sitting around. At one point, a table got broken. So a couple of guys decided the table legs would make great spears to uh. and use those TVs as uh, as the target. And uh, it, it, it worked pretty effectively. But the funny thing was, and, and we, it got too wild a little bit, but I will, I'm proud to say we did get everybody home safely. There was a lot of cars still in the parking lot because we had to have people shuttled home because people were blown off steam and probably, you know, a little too much. But the next day at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, I got a phone call and it was the building owner. And he said, uh, do you guys have something up at the, the lodge last night? I said, yeah, yeah, we did. There's beer leaking through the ceiling in my store. <laughs> I said, oh, really? He goes, yeah, it's beer. You can smell it. And it's it's leaking through the ceiling pretty bad. So I got up, not feeling very well, drove down there, went up to the lodge, and the carpet was soaked in beer, gallons and gallons of beer. And apparently what had happened was we had a big table that we'd been piling all the empties on and making like the beer can pyramid. And someone who shall remain nameless but went on to be a high-ranking police official, his friend looked at him and he said, you know, I think you need to go sailing into those. So he picked him up and threw him into the, the beer can pile. And all that remainder in the beer cans, the hundreds of beer cans went on the floor and drained through Oopsie. down <laughs> into the business downstairs, which of course was open. And uh, we lost our lodge shortly after that. So that and was rightfully truly so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> under your leadership, under my no leadership. Less. Well, so, you know, that sounded like a, a scene from the choir boys. Yeah. <laughs> the movie which i think if if you haven't seen that you guys should look it up on youtube or something because there was wasn't there two or three there was a choir boys and then there yeah. it seemed like there was two or three kind of in that that series george kennedy i think yeah. was in one of them. i haven't yeah. seen those movies in years and years and years i couldn't even tell you anything about it's, them but i remember well it's fun because six inch revolvers and swivel <laughs> holsters you know and <laughs> so, uh, well i guess the the question is roy have we done a disservice here you know, I feel kind of bad telling these stories, but they really happened, you know, and it and I'm pretty sure it still goes on today. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like I said earlier, it, I think it helps. Uh, I'm not condoning throwing officers into the giant beer can pyramid, and losing your lodge over it, but um, or spearing the t television screens with the broken table legs. But, you know, again, I, that was a special circumstance because everybody needed to blow off a little steam after, you know, a, a huge tragedy that we'd all shared in. I, you know, it was, it was a different time and, <laughs> and I'm cruel. not saying that because we meet, we mistreated, uh, female cops. Many people did. Yeah. I didn't, but many people did. And, and, and authority got abused at times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
But, in, but I think at the other side of that, though, is and I'm not justifying anything, but people have to remember there was no Internet. There was no massive computer database like we have today. There were basic beginnings of those kind of things. And the radio communication was iffy at best often. I mean, I often was in the field with no portable radio. Right. And no body armor in the early days. And so you were really on your own. And, and, and part of that was you had to develop that ability to rely on your buddies. And those, that, those days of police work were gut level, gut feeling. You acted on instincts, you acted on experience, you know, and, and I, I see today and I, cause I've talked to some young cops and it's like, well, you know, first you run the database and then you check the, this file and then you get a, you know, tell this thing and then you call the, you know, and I mean, it's just like, and then, and they, and they send their pictures instantly. They take their pictures, they immediately get their criminal history, you know, and all that. And in those days it was, you know, you and some miscreant and handcuffs sitting on a curb at three o'clock in the morning while you're trying to figure out who he is and and was he a criminal. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so uh, I, I, you know what, I'm going to make something up now. It was analog police work. Yeah. That's and, a good way to put it. And today it's digital police work. Yeah. You know, and so I, I think you need to seek out and find a couple young guys and see if you can coerce them to come on under, <laughs> you know, with a disguised voice or yeah, something. That would be fun. <laughs> and because I, you know, I, I don't hear that this kind of a thing goes on anymore just because, I mean, good Lord, they've got, you know, tracking every, if you have a cell phone, they know exactly where you are, yeah. you know. And the police cars. And so I don't think they do those things. And anymore, if you're going to do I, something stupid, somebody's going to, even one of your own guys is going to videotape or uh, t- uh, yeah. film it off of your and phone post and post it on, it on social, social media. media. <laughs> really? Does that seem like a good idea? But no. And, and I, I will say know, too, I just, you know, we are the old guys. We are, we really are. But I was also thinking if I get any, uh, before you sat down to write the poison pen letter, and this is terrible, and I'm not, I would bet, even if you're not in law enforcement, whatever your profession is, you've had a few parties, you've blown off some steam. I realize there's that small percentage of folks that never do that and never, you know, color outside the lines. But I, I would say this, we're talking about law enforcement because that's our, been our, our lives, but I would say m- most professions especially any that feature any kind of danger or the type of thing where you know it's it's pretty serious business you have your moments i know doctors do it i know uh pilots do it um there's many other careers i uh, utility people you know uh that's i didn't go into utilities because you know a bullet may hit you but it may not man you you touch an alive electrical line once even with 40 years experience and you're done so, you know, everybody uh, that I think faces those uh, kind of uh, odds in their job, I think they probably have a tradition, too. So it might be interesting. Maybe we need to do a little survey of what did you guys do in your job to uh, kind of blow off some steam? You're right. I think there are certain jobs that just uh, promote that uh, tight knit you know, sense of fellowship kind mm-hmm. of, and, and you're right. Firefighters, paramedics, doc, ER doctors and ER staff, especially, oh, yeah. exactly. You know, I mean, they're every bit as bad as we ever were, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or good. I don't know what the right word is there. Yeah. And the military, of course. Oh, of and course. I think, yeah. And I, cause I think today the younger military people, the, the guys that came back from the sandbox and stuff, they seem like they're, they're very close with each other mm-hmm. and that, you know, they, if, if the buddy calls, it's like, you drop what you're doing, yep. you know? And so it was a little bit like that, but I don't know if we broke new ground or if we're going to get arrested or in trouble or anything, <laughs> but I'd like to hear if there's some old cops in the audience just tell us like, you know, a couple funny stories yeah. in a comment. We'd love to hear. Them. I was going to say, if there's some old cops in the audience, Oh Lord, I get the letters every single solitary week and, and I love them. Uh, <laughs> what, what's scary though, Dude. is when it, it turns out he's an old, you know, retired cop and that he was actually uh, still on the job when I retired <laughs> that that'll make you feel old, but oh, uh, God, well, yeah. you hear how about this one? I retired in 98. And Susie still, you know, looks at some Facebook things about yeah. police departments and stuff like that. Well, do the math. That's 24 years ago. 
Wow. And so she shows me pictures of people, you know, retiring who came on after <laughs> I retired. So, <laughs> yep, yep. Well, it, but, and my hmm. role is uh, I'm on the city council here and I'm the liaison to the police department. And it's getting to the point. I don't know a lot of these young guys. And I see them. We actually on Monday, we swore, swore in three new officers and one of the other council people because they look so young. It's like I, I want to take them in my arms and say, you understand this is <laughs> going to get ugly before it gets better. OK, <laughs> it is true. You know, they they used to say that. Uh, a new policeman really wasn't worthwhile or worth his, his uh, salary until they've been on about five years. Yep, absolutely. And, and it is, I think it's many levels. It's true. You know, you, you can fill a beat car, you can answer radio calls, you can do that, but, well, you know, you really don't get your legs until a, a few years under your belt and uh, one or three choir practices under your belt too. So <laughs> I think this was fun. Thanks for inviting me to do oh, this. With of course. And again, I, I'm so worried about the feedback we're going to get, because I'm sure we're going to get some They're terrible. I think you people are <laughs> rotten. Well, we are. Okay. Are you happy there? I admit it. We're rotten to the core, but <laughs> rotten. <laughs> Just and then, okay. Not. And if that's the case, if there's a lot of whiners, then we need a choir practice part do that's yeah. And then and then we'll dig out the stories that we didn't want to tell this show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe we could do that. Like, uh, yeah, that would be the super premium. You got to pay like three ninety nine to hear that version. <laughs> it's true. Wow. Hey, oh, the well. boss would like that probably, but oh, that Lord. would probably get us in trouble. We have we've only scratched the barely PG stories. But we're, we're, again, I feel terrible. We're casting this light like we're all a bunch of heathens, but. Uh, I think everybody who's reached this point in life has probably had a heathen moment or two. So fortunately, we're still here to talk about it. So, well, Roy, thank you so much. And uh, uh, next time I'm out there or you're in here, we're going to have to think of that part, too. So whatever the uh, folks in the audience uh, reach out to me at editor at gunsmagazine.com or if you're listening on YouTube, leave a comment. I, I and Roy would just certainly like to hear your stories and the new guys and gals. Let us know what what goes on, even if you have to uh, uh, use, use your sergeant's name when you post it. Just uh, let us know how, how things go. But anyway, Roy, it's been fun, and we'll get together and do this again soon. Thank you, sir. It's always fun telling old war stories with Roy, and I hope you're also finding them enjoyable. If you like this episode, check out episode 100, Gun Rider Insider Stories, or number 130, The Day I Got Shot. And finally, check out episode number 139, Cop Practical Jokes. If there's a topic you want to hear, somebody you'd like us to interview, or you want to share your thoughts, please drop me a line at editor at gunsmagazine.com. As always, you can find us on your favorite podcast directory, YouTube, and at gunsmagazine.com. And, of course, while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com, AmericanCop.com, and our numerous special editions available for sale on our websites and at Amazon. And don't forget to check out our new presenting sponsor, the R7 Mako by Kimber. Learn more at R7Mako.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Yeah.